Hello, I'm Suzanne James. Welcome to another edition of the Green Left Show. Before we begin, I'd like to start by acknowledging the traditional owners of this land in which we live and work and pay my respects to elders, past, present and future. We also acknowledge that sovereignty was never ceded. Today's topic is defence, including Australia's increasingly strained relations with China. In that vein, I would also like to acknowledge the many Chinese Australians that live and work peacefully amongst us and give a great contribution to Australian society. The first part of the show is an interview with Greens New South Wales Senator David Subridge, recently sworn in on 1st July after the Greens enjoyed a landslide victory in the 2022 federal election. That's followed by an interview with Dr William Briggs. He's a fellow contributor to Green Left and has written several books in relation to Australian international relations, including A Cauldron of Anxiety in China and The USA and Capitalism's Last Crusade. And if you like our work, don't forget you can like and subscribe and become a contributor to Green Left financially for as little as $5 a month. Hope you enjoy the show. Hello, I'm Suzanne James for Green Left. Thank you for joining us. Today, we will be catching up with Greens MP, David Subridge, recently sworn in on 1st of July to a federal Senate seat after the Greens enjoyed an unprecedented result in the recent election. He joins us today from Sydney. David Subridge, thank you for joining us. Yeah, my pleasure, Suzanne. Always good to chat. Now, look, just before we get into weighty issues of defence and justice, of which, as you know, there are many right now, take us back to election night. How did you feel when you realised your... Um, balance of power Senate campaign did not only come to fruition but then some and you saw that map turn green including in of all places Queensland what was that like? Well it was the election party you want to be at wasn't it so we um <laughs> we were watching the numbers come in and you know it, it's actually hard to get a handle on the Senate vote very early on in the count but we were getting uh, messages coming from the sort of um from from an advanced team who were following the sort of um, national count and we were getting messages coming directly from Brisbane. And what we were getting from Brisbane was showing such amazing results that we were kind of thinking, oh, maybe that's, you know, one of those outlier poll boot, polling booths. We don't want to get too excited. And then the data just kept coming in and, um, and it all sort of came together at, at roughly the same moment. In fact, I remember I was watching um, Libby one of the our three new Greens um, uh, lower house members. She was actually speaking to the ABC, I think, live from her election party. And in the middle of speaking to the ABC, she was actually told by the team that she'd won the spot. <laughs> and um, oh, and uh, so, yeah, it was the election night party that you want to have. But um, and it was all, and that was very euphoric and really positive. But I, I recall, you know. I was about, to, was about to sort of leave the party. I was sitting down with my, my wife, Patricia, and, and one of my daughters. And I remember having this kind of, it flipped from a kind of euphoria and happiness to this kind of real sense of responsibility. And, um, and you know, I don't get this much in my job. I, I like to sort of forge him forward. I, but I, there was this sort of moment of responsibility and, and, and anxiety about, well, okay, now we better bloody do something with it. And, um, but it was overwhelmingly euphoria. Um, and, you know, shared with our, with our campaign team, shared with our supporters. But I'd be wrong if I, I didn't say there was also this kind of level of genuine sense of resp responsibility and anxiety. Well, you know, you don't want to be like the dog that has chased the car for three years and then finally grabbed hold of their bumper bar and doesn't know what to do with it. This sense of let's make sure um, we make it work. Now, Alibet clearly uh, knows that you do know exactly what to do with your Senate spot. He's given you the triple portfolio of defence, veterans affairs, justice and digital rights. Is that correct? Yeah, that's a, it, it's a solid workload. Yeah. But that being said, okay. um, I've come from a state portfolio list that I had to sort of, you know, get tattooed up my arm. It was like eight or nine long. So I, um, our team is actually really excited, even though it's a big load, 
you know, all the AGs and the justice, veterans, digital rights and um, defence, even though it's a big load, it's actually more focused than we've had at the state level and we're kind of excited by that too. I'd like to talk first about your defence portfolio. As we know, there's an awful lot of stuff crawling away in the background there right now, including the um, Chinese foreign minister being on TV earlier, basically selling Australia in relation to Taiwan. We should just stay out of it. Um, what's your view on Nancy Pelosi's visit? Why do you think she was really there? It's without creating, hopefully, you know, international incidents. But this was... The, you know, this was telegraphed in advance. It was sort of created almost to create an incident and, and to feed into a kind of anxiety escalation framework. And, and I don't, I think anyone would suggest that's not helpful. Um, you know, there would have been other ways for her to visit Taiwan without sort of feeding into this confrontation escalation narrative. And, and I think, I just don't think it was well handled. But look, I would hope that, um, democratically elected representatives are free to go to come to, to places like Taiwan to um, to to go and you know share ideas share 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 value but I think the idea of making the visit part of an escalation conflict narrative was was the real problem with that okay speaking of narratives and problems with visits I'd like to talk now about NATO now you'd be aware a lot of people on the left, are quite critical of NATO and the European Union and believe some US aggression in the area may have led to Putin invading Ukraine in the first place. The other side of the argument is, well, given what's going on with China and they're buying Russian sanctioned oil and the behaviour of MH17 and now in Ukraine, really there was no choice other than to ramp NATO up, which is something supported also by the British Foreign Secretary. What's your view on that? Do you think NATO is part of the problem or part of the solution or is we, are we a bit too far down the track for it to matter now? Well, I, th I think if you, if you centre that discussion around NATO, um, then you're probably starting at, at the wrong point because NATO is, you know, it's a, it's a military alliance and what we have is uh, we have, a, a, you know, an ongoing political conflict um, now, I've had people ask me to condemn decisions by Finland and Sweden to join NATO and condemn and say, you know, Ukraine should never join NATO. I don't think it's the job of a politician in Australia to be condemning those kinds of, those kinds of actions. We don't have the same, you know, obvious real threat to our, um, to our existence as Finland and Sweden and the Ukraine have. Um, but, I mean, what I would hope is that we don't, as Australia, say, well, the only solution to these kinds of conflicts is a militarised framework um, and we do it through a kind of NATO response. And I think, you know, part of the, the, the if you want to go back over the last 20 or 30 years, you can see that that, that militarised response has, has not created a safe environment and hasn't de-escalated tensions in the region. Now, I, I'm, you know, I'm, I, I will condemn what the, uh, the Vladimir Putin's invasion of Ukraine. It was an act of a brutal, uncalled for aggression. Um, I don't, I'm not interested in going through an historical explanation for why that happened. It is a brutal um, act of aggression. But I, I, but I think we also have a collective responsibility on the part of the West to understand why these things happen to have a look and see whether or not our actions have um, made these kinds of conflicts more likely, to learn those histories, to learn those lessons from history and to, to try and de-escalate in the future. And, you know, I think we could be very critical of a whole series of actions that the United States and the West have taken over the last 30 years that have kind of allowed us to sleepwalk into yet another major potentially global conflict and um, and and so 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 I, I I think having the discussion entirely focused around NATO is is a discussion that's not going to have a long-standing permanent solution to this problem well at least not one that's Speaking. peaceful at least not one that's peaceful and that and that looks for the the you know the huge amount of common interests we have between the Russian people the Australian people the Ukrainian people I mean People to people interests are far more common than our leaders. 
speaking of de-escalation, um, Penny Wong recently said it in relation to the Asia Pacific region and Solomon Islands, etc. All parties need to look at what they can do to de-escalate tension. So I know in the Solomons in particular, Australia has had a number of expensive deployments over a long time, including in the Solomon Islands and Ramsey and all the rest of it. And I just wonder, do you feel that we're still able to manage expectations in relation to China in the region, or is it all just not coming much to fruition as we'd hoped? Well, the biggest problem with Labor's de-escalation narrative is on the one hand, they say they want to de-escalate and they want to have a more mature relationship. But on the other hand, they're backing in the coalition's decision to spend over $170 billion on nuclear powered submarines whose only purpose is to have forward deployment and the projection of Australian force into the immediate vicinity of China. Now, you, you can't de-escalate on one side with your rhetoric, and then on the other hand, be spending a huge amount of our collective wealth on a weapon whose only purpose is to project power, military power, literally onto China's doorstep. Um, so I, I, if I was, you know, if, if I was a, a foreign power and I had another country say, well, they've got a press release talking about de-escalation, but they've bought a hugely expensive weapon system that is designed to project power to our doorstep, I'd be looking more at their actions than at their, than at their, um, their rhetoric. And, um, and that's what we should expect any nation in our region to do, to be more closely looking at our actions than our rhetoric. And unfortunately, under the coalition, the actions and the rhetoric were both deeply unhelpful. Um, so I, I'll give Labor this credit, their, their, their rhetoric has improved slightly, but we've inherited this, you know, super aggressive um, acquisition of weapons that are designed entirely for us to be a junior partner of the United States, um, projecting power right onto China's doorstep, and that is against the rhetoric. So that brings us neatly into the current defence review, the Albanese government has announced. Everybody widely agrees that it's definitely way overdue, although not everybody's happy with his choice of existing command to run it. What do you think we can expect out of this defence review? Less submarines and more tech? And are they going to cover cultural issues such as alleged war crimes in Afghanistan and issues like that as well? Well, the former chief of the ADF, um, um, uh, Barry, said that the single biggest destabilizing force that Australia is going to confront over the next 10 and 20 years is the impact of climate change. Um, it's going to have major destabilizing impacts in our near neighborhood, in our, in our immediate neighborhood, really big impacts on, on across the Pacific, on, on Papua New Guinea, on Indonesia, Malaysia. Um, and um, unless we see that defense more broadly in terms of security, social security, regional stability, and we put climate change square into our defence review, well, we're missing probably what is going to be the biggest potential source of conflict in the region. Conflict over resources, conflict over, um, conflict over land, conflict over huge potential um, human population movements. Um, that needs to be front and centre in our defence review. And I haven't heard much, if anything, about that from Labor in its terms of reference of the defence review. So I, we, we, we will, we're in the process of engaging with the minister in that regard and seeking some assurance from him that the impacts of climate change and the response to climate change will be a core part of the review. We'll, 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 we'll um, keep you posted if we get a useful response. The other thing I'd say about the review is that it's been undertaken by two of the architects of the current defence posture, you know, a former Labor Defence Minister and a former senior um, um, uh, defence uh, member of the Defence Forces. Now, these are two people who are in part responsible for our current defence posture. They clearly have a conflict of interest in terms of doing a review um, of the current um, um, outlay and strategic direction of defence. I think that's a flaw in the review and I can't understand why Labor built that structural floor into the review, but they have. Um, but of course, what I what I am hopeful for is that if we sit down and have a very, you know, a holistic view of our defence, we'll focus more upon partners, being partner, 
um, with our immediate neighbours and our regional neighbours. We'll focus more on the impacts of climate and our responsibility to mitigate our, our impacts on climate and to help build resilience in the region on climate. Um, and we will hopefully see some of the hugely expensive but entirely unintegrated and unassessed we um, um, weapons projects, like for example, the nuclear subs, be given a serious cost benefit analysis. And I would have thought that any serious cost benefit analysis would see us end that program. Thank you so much for your time. Thanks, Susan. Today, I will be interviewing Dr. William Briggs, who is a fellow contributor to the Green Left online and in print. He's also an author of several books in relation to international relations and geopolitics, including A Cauldron of Anxiety in China and the USA and Capitalism's Last Crusade. William joins us now from Geelong. Thank you very much, William, for your time. Thank you. Pleasure. Now, I'd like to start by talking about the ever-growing list of issues in relation to China. Most recently, we've seen Nancy Pelosi visit Taiwan and China has retaliated quite strongly in relation to that. We saw the Chinese ambassador at the National Press Club this week pretty much telling Australia to stay out of it. Richard Miles, thankfully, has been able to make some inroads into calming the situation down and Penny Wong on her apology tour of the Pacific trying to repair our post LNP government shredded relations has said that all parties need to look at what they can do to try and um, tone down the rhetoric around it. How do you see the whole situation there now? Is it, is it the case of China's gonna go ahead and do what they were always going to do regardless? Um, to begin with, I mean, that whole Pelosi thing was as a provocative as it could imaginably be for a very real reason. Um, China, China's stance on Taiwan is, it just didn't happen last week. They've been talking like this for an awfully long time because right or wrong, they believe they have a legitimate claim to Taiwan. Now that's not for me to say whether that's correct or incorrect, but that's how they feel. And they base an awful lot of their domestic legitimacy on this nationalist perspective, the national symbolisms and bringing Taiwan back to the motherland and all the rest of it. Um, whether or not push goes to shove to such a degree that China does militarily get involved is in the realms of the work of the seer. And unfortunately, I haven't got quite those gifts. But I am aware that later this year, the Communist Party are having their party congress. And at that congress, Xi will almost inevitably get another five-year term as, uh, as leader. Now, if he were to pull the trigger today, he would have to be absolutely assured of a result favourable to, to, to the Chinese by about Saturday. Because if it lingered, if it wore on, if it was another Ukraine thing, heading into that Congress where so much legitimacy is based on unifying China, if missiles were starting to rain on Shanghai and Beijing, then that would be difficult. It would be difficult for him to get around. So I can't see anything particular happening in the immediate future. And I'm pretty sure the Pentagon and Washington are as well aware of that as I might be which is why they are more inclined to go, to prod, to poke and to push right now. Um, so whether it does escalate is, is another matter. Um, what Australia's position on this is interesting because as you, as you say about Miles and Wong uh, giving the impression, I think, of trying to play an honest broker, I'm less convinced of that because every step along the way for every Australian government in the recent history has been almost a universal one. Albanese, of course, the result wasn't even in when he was off to, to Japan to the meeting to convince everybody that you don't have to worry about Australia. We are with you every inch of the way. Um, Australia's uh, 
policy in the last period has been one of a massive arms builder. There's nothing to indicate that that is not going to continue with the new government. Uh, we've now hit the 2% of GDP on, uh, on the military spending. Uh, we're developing a, an arms industry which replaces an industry policy. We're um, looking to become number 10 arms trader and arms dealer in the world. Uh, we do everything we can to convince the US that we will do our bit and more in the region. Now, that is, to my mind, I can't see anything in our present government that is going to change that long-term course because none of the decisions that happen in Washington, I am convinced, happen without close consultation with their friends and allies in the region. And Australia plays a significant role in that. It's not good for Australia, but Australia's interest, its interest of its economy and of its statehood is tied to the US and particularly through US investment in Australia. And we need to be reminded of a statement made by Biden when he was vice president that simply said, we're here for the long haul, we're going to remain on top, and it's always a bad bet to bet against the United States. And 25% of all of our investment comes from the United States, which is a very big stick to uh, wield over Australia, and the carrot being the 25%. Now, there are serious ramifications for Australia as an economy because of the trade deals with China and so on, 30% of our trade with China. That, um, that can be very dangerously impinged upon. But we've also got to remember that Australian capitalism is not some sort of uh, monolith. There are sections of capital that would be terribly upset at the loss of Chinese trade, um, particularly those extractive industries that rely on China. But there are other sections of capital that are less dependent upon China and recognise the need of that American investment. Um, and the Australian state has created a feeling within the Australian people that China is no longer to be trusted. And it's been a steady procession. The Lowy Institute um, um, surveys every year show this. 10, 15 years ago, there were 50, 60 percent of the population believing that China would behave appropriately, whatever that happens to be. Then bit by bit, it's down about 16 percent today. And every time one of those surveys come out, the same media that created the ill feeling use the statistics to show how dangerous China is. So it would be nice to have a Labor government doing all the right things. Certainly would. But I cannot see it happening based on a history of Australian-US alliance relations and our lockstep with US uh, dictators. I don't know Do you think the Australian government's bigger task now is managing expectations at home or managing China's expectations abroad? Yeah, interesting, interesting and a very important area. Um, in some ways both, but um, the government's um, position domestically has been one Sounds almost paranoid, but Australia's main claim to fame over the last 200 years or so has been based on fear. We have maintained our sense of usness and unity by always being fearful that somebody or some group of people are coming from the dangerous north to take all of our stuff. Now, they haven't come, but it is almost ingrained in the psyche now of the people to expect confrontation and fear. We have a terrible xenophobia in this country and an anti-China stuff that has been built from, from decades and decades of, of, of the parliaments of Australia. Now, while we can present China as uh, an authoritarian regime, as it is, so much to the good for Australia, for Australian uh, political processes, if we can convince the people to be fearful of China, that enables the state 
to become increasingly militarized because this is money to defend us. And at the same time, there is an instinctive um, dislike, if you like, of the United States alliance, a distrust of America. So we have successive speakers now uh, calling for more and more homegrown defence. We must become able to uh, stand up to China because we can't guarantee a United States defence of us. Now, so therefore, we need to invest more and more heavily in the military. That's the domestic side of things. Um, at the same time, the United States, in its fairly unabashed push towards conflict with China for economic reasons, is demanding that countries in the region, Japan, Korea, Australia, up the ante on their own military spending because you've got to do, show willing, do your bit in this. And it is, from the United States perspective, particularly one of economic struggle, not ideological struggle with China. So Australia plays this dual role of appearing to be a great independent rising power or middle power that can defend itself, which it clearly can't, if that happened, and supporting and appeasing an America that demands that we, that we spend more, do more, uh, to make the, any push against China, any um, push back against China, that more successful. So. Speaking of defence spending, amongst other things, this morning we've seen the interim report into the Royal Commission into Veteran Suicide drop. There's a number of recommendations out of that the government's already enacting, including clearing the backlog of 46,000 compensation applications. The other half of that equation is the defence review that's recently been announced by the Albanese government. Now, it's broadly agreed, I think, that the review's overdue and definitely needs to happen in the current geopolitical context, although not everybody is happy with his choice of taking the two people to run it out of the existing command that created the current structure in the first place. So there's so many issues that review is going to have to look at. It's hard to know where it's going to start, and where it's going to finish. My personal view is that they need to perhaps look at greater efficiency in all these billions and billions of dollars of defence spending and have less subs and more tech. Look at things such as um, cyber capability and early warning systems and, and surveillance technology and things like that. Is it your view that that's where any review of defence and it's many, many, many billions of dollars in contracts needs to go, apart from the cultural issues, obviously, of things driving alleged war crimes in Afghanistan, etc., cetera, etc.? Cetera? Yeah, I, I suppose so. It makes logical sense what you say. If you accept the premise that there is some sort of threat. Now, since the end of the Second World War, we have been preparing one way or another for some external threat. There has never been any evidence of such a threat, and there still isn't any evidence of such a threat. If you look for where the um, Chinese army are, they're in China. If you look for where the Navy are, they're on the coast of China. Look for where the Air Force is, et cetera, et cetera. Um, they are traditionally not an expansionist incursionary power. For us to become more militaristic in the region, to encourage an arms race in the region, may make that dangerous. So if we are having more um, better use of our defence hundreds of billions of dollars, to counter a, a potential threat that actually needn't exist, then there's no way that that spending is ever going to be really justifiable. Particularly when we keep on using that term and it becomes uh, impossible not to use the term defense. There is nothing defensive about any of the military spending of Australia. Uh, there is nothing defensive about this at all. We have had moments of absolute sheer lunacy when we've talked of, in terms seriously of over the border defence, over the horizon defence, sorry. Over the horizon uh, defence is offence, can only be themed in that regard. Now, the review 
Um, again, it may sound cynical, but I think the review is more in terms of window dressing to keep the same set of policies in order. Um, yeah, there'll be a bit of a uh, bit of tinkering, a bit of um, pruning, a bit of uh, making things more um, tightly audited, if you like. But the actual trajectory isn't going to change dramatically. And if you talk about the, the personnel that people are so critical of, um, Houston and Smith, um, it is, I think, laughable for people such as the opposition figures and so on and, and some of the characters out of Aspie and so on to, to, to ridicule this because Smith was a defence minister at the time when Obama's pivot to Asia happened. That pivot to Asia was both trade and military. The trade was a deal to keep everybody in the camp except China because we had to roll back China's economic uh, power. And at the same time, the United States started the policy of bringing at least 60% of their uh, naval and air force cap capabilities into the South China Sea. Now, that doesn't happen in a vacuum. Smith was, was part of those negotiations. Obama actually made some of these statements in Australia. Houston was chief of defense at that time as well. Now, the fact that Australia is being accused of that period of not spending enough on, on military is also a reflection of the global situation at the time when the United States hadn't yet changed their policy of war on terror. That in the late 20s, they shifted their entire military doctrine to one away from the war on terror to one of uh, global great power rivalry and uh, competition. That necessitated the spending more money, that necessitated those processes. Now, to say that Smith wasn't signing off on big enough arms deals, he wasn't called upon to at that stage. Uh, but the review includes a couple of very key um, statements, if you like that we must be prepared and ready for state on state conflict, which is in the preview of the review, um, which is absolutely in line with the Pentagon's argument about great power rivalry. Because what's gonna happen now, this AUKUS is still gonna be there, the hypersonic uh, missile things are still gonna be going on, uh, the nuclear subs and that coyly termed off the shelf subs, uh, as an interim measure, that's all. That's none of that's going to go away. Uh, the idea of the Tomahawk cruise missiles, that's not miraculously going to disappear because of this review. Uh, and the leaders of the review are committed to maintaining Australia's preparedness. Uh, the other thing that they use is, uh, what's the term, making sure that the, the, um, the capability gap is not uh, too big. The capability gap, what does that mean? That means effectively that we say we're going to be more belligerent and stand up and be all sort of puffy puffy with China, but we also have to have the capability to do that. And if that is what they're saying at this stage of the review, then we can only look forward to more of the same. Because the real motivations behind all of this is to ensure US economic superiority and to diminish China because the US is declining, China is rising. And that's like the rising of the sun and the setting of it. That's what's going on. And so as much as it'd be nice to see uh, a more, more sane approach from our government, I can't see it happening. And in reality, you're not the first to point out that should China, if we weren't in alliance with the United States, should China decide to somehow occupy or, or come over to Australia unwelcome, there's really not a lot we could do about it without agreement is that correct yeah that, that is again assuming that such a such a thing would happen yeah I i'm mean, not um, assuming that it will it's just no, that's no, the no. rhetoric isn't yeah, it, if, that they're running. Okay, yeah if in the wildest imaginings uh any country chose to um, act aggressively towards australia in our region um th there's very little that could be done anyway because the the uh the u.s alliance the pact with the u.s alliance is such an ambiguous document. We are compelled to support the US. There is no reciprocal 
compulsion upon the United States to actually defend Australia in that uh, obscure uh, offering that we might need defending. Every chance they would, but there's no guarantees. And because there the are no guarantees... The assumption always is that they will, but you only got to look at someone like Donald Trump. Say, God forbid, he got re-elected. I'm pretty yeah. sure you couldn't guarantee on an alliance that you didn't have a legislative gun to hold of his head to make him do it. <laughs> yeah, sure. Sure. Yeah. Okay, that all being the case, we're locked into trade with China and we're trying to repair relations as best we can whilst condemning their actions everywhere from Russia to Ukraine to the South China Sea. We're locked into an alliance with the US because clearly we couldn't defend ourselves if we didn't, regardless of the other history and the alliance, long-standing alliance between the two nations and Britain is another wild card. That all being the case, where do you, I'd like to talk to you now about activism. Where do you see anti-war, no nukes? I mean, I can't believe we're here again. We're seeing posters again, no nukes, no nuclear war, anti-war protests. I was a child of the Cold War. And I've seen it all before. And Khrushchev was going to bury us all. And we were seeing post-apocalyptic nuclear war movies at primary school. And it was all happening. We heard the same China rhetoric then, the same anti-Russian then, the same anti-everything. I accept that the world's changed quite a bit in that time. But from what I can tell, a lot of activism struggling to cut through these days with the media the way it is and draconian anti-protest laws. So all things considered, What's your advice for the next generation? Where would you like to see that go in terms of independent media and social media and the tools that we do still have at our disposal? Yeah. Um, well, speaking from the perspective of someone who is rapidly seeing his dotage appear, um, I would, yes, we've all been here before. We've all seen this before. The, um, the doomsday clock at the atomic Europe, um, science, the sort of the institution is called, have now set it at 100 seconds to midnight, which is the closest to elimination since 1945. That includes um, Cuban missile crisis periods, nuclear threats, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. It's at that stage, I believe, because of a absolute, not so much. People talk about sleepwalking to war. I see this as happening with eyes wide open. I see that um, I see this as economic in in um, in impetus. I see it as a, a crisis within global capitalism as a as a compounding factor. I see it as countries who have been impelled or compelled because of when they when the world deglobalized, if you like, to go back into economic nationalism and nationalism and countries arm against other countries and so on. That is just a simple fact of life. And what this means for activism is extra difficult because we are in a situation where the state is, has never been as threatened, not by activists, by the people, but by the system that it supports. Capitalism is in absolute crisis. Now, the months before COVID, for instance, the whole Western world was engulfed in tear gas. Everywhere in the world, People were on the streets in their tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands. Small, seemingly small issues would trigger phenomenal risings of people because they were all, all of them, including us, faced with the same dilemmas. And those dilemmas are even worse now. The economy is in absolute crisis. Um, people can't afford housing. Inflation's rising, et cetera, et cetera. We all know the story. Now, what does this do for protest movements, in, there are two, or at least two possible approaches. You can recognise the state is acting not from any position of strength, but one of intense weakness, when it has to be almost prepared to say, look, you come out there, we'll walk on your faces. Uh, when the state is, is increasingly militarised in a civil setting, where police are more heavily armed than ever before and are using more and more repressive uh, measures. Just the other day here in Victoria, um, our Labor government, uh, with the support of the, of the Liberals, just enacted their round of, of anti-protest uh, legislation in keeping with others. So you can do, I think, 12 months now for, for protesting. Um, to my humble, in my humble opinion, the only way to approach this is the way protest has traditionally been enacted, 
if the state is showing weakness, it's time to make those protests bigger, more visible, more obvious. The, the other areas, the social media, the, the cyber approaches, yeah, they're good. They're, and I wouldn't discount those for a second, but people on the street being visible, being obvious is, I think, the way to go. And it needs, it does need courage. It needed courage at every stage of those 50 odd years that I've been involved in, in, in the socialist movement. It's never been easy, but it's more difficult now, but the stakes are higher now as well. So I would be strongly advising people to get up, get out and struggle because just there's a little quote that just popped into my head. Warren Buffett, God bless him. We all know, know and admire him so much. A few years ago, when the capitalist crisis was only just starting to really sharpen, made a, made a comment, and I can almost quote it directly. Yes, there is a class war, and it's my class, his class, the ruling class, that are fighting it, and we are winning. Now, they're going to keep on winning unless somebody engages them in a figuratively and literal battle. And that happens by anti-war movement activists um, becoming engaged with trade union activists, with trade union activists being on the anti-war picket lines and so on. Everybody working with everybody. Uh, whatever those social movements that people are involved in, they've all got the same enemy. And uh, whether that enemy is a homegrown one or an international one, uh, they all need to be struggled against. And whatever means you can, but by certainly, certainly, all those social media stuff by all means, as a means of assembling people together in one place and working on people's mindsets, but get them out on the streets. That's where we will turn people. Look, just before we finish, I'd like to go off script for a sec and just talk briefly about what's happening in the Ukraine. Now, that war's been raging on for, what, six months now? Mm. Yeah, yep. February. Um, yeah. They've um, had considerable military hardware and financial support from America, Australia, various other alliances through the NATO forum and pretty much whatever, whatever other help they can get their hands on. It's quite astounding that they've managed to hold out for as long as they have, but surely Zelensky, regardless of how popular he is in his homeland, can't maintain that forever under sustained fire, but there does seem to be cracks appearing in the Russian approach as well. How do you see that going over the next, I don't know, two, maybe three months? Where do you think that's at right now? Yeah. Um, the the whys and the wherefores, the rights and the wrongs of the war, <clears throat> uh, I think beyond um, needs to talk about anymore. It's been so many words have been spoken, so many, uh, so many gallons of ink have been, been dispensed. I think the issue is that the war needn't be continuing. But no side, none of the belligerent sides, seem inclined to negotiate their way out of it. Now, I think the biggest issue is going to be not so much the war, but the peace. What happens when the war eventually does end, and it will end? And the thing that uh, concerns me a little bit here, or concerns me a lot, is that um, Zelensky uh, has recently acknowledged to a to an organization called the um, I just off the top of my head to the CEO um, conference or something like that it was was hosted by in, in the United States by the Wall Street Journal or somebody saying that when it's all over we'll get things going very quickly and we will guarantee to you to global capital access open access to our markets to our people to our 40 million or whatever it is um, he, at the same time, called for war reparations against Russia. Now, that is so clearly a recipe for future disasters. If we just go back to um, post-World War I and the reparations against Germany and a, and a humiliated people. Now, on top of that, there was almost an immediate call for a, uh, a second Marshall Plan that the United States uh, really pushing for and the EU are pushing for um, because there's going to be vast amounts of money poured in. The, the cost of the war is variously described between 500 billion and a trillion dollars. That 
as of last week, add on, add on every day. Now, the whole rebuilding program is going to be good for, in the, in the immediate future, good for possibly the Ukrainian people, but better for capital, capitalism, because they are the ones that are going to be making money out of this. Um, if Ukraine managed to come out ahead, then their working class are going to face, bear the brunt of the reform packages that the IMF are going to be putting in place. If we look at Greece, if we look at uh, Sri Lanka and so on, There's, the strings are phenomenally tight. Um, so people, particularly on the left, have spoken a lot about um, the right to self-determination for Ukraine. And that's a very useful and well worthy slogan. But given the fact that the Ukrainian people are being forced to support a pro-capitalist, out now pro-capitalist government, their self-determination is going to become weaker and weaker and weaker after the war if the carpetbaggers of capitalism roll in. Um, Zelensky has also just recently effectively outlawed um, trade union movements in Ukraine whilst calling on the Ukrainian people to support him. Now, same deal with, with, with Russia and Putin. I mean, the Russian people will go on suffering. Putin is the, is the enemy. Zelensky is the enemy, if you like. It's the, the people who are suffering are the working class in both those countries that are being manipulated by Russia by the Ukrainians and definitely by the United States and the EU. So um, what happens in the immediate future, I don't know. I can only see more of the same in the, in the, for the next few months. But at some stage, things are going to change and that peace is going to come and the peace is going to be a terrible peace for the Ukrainian people. And that I feel terribly sorry for, but uh, such is life. You've got to feel for the Ukrainians and for the poor people in Russia as well. Thank you, William, for joining us today. Much appreciated. That brings us to the end of another Greenleaf show. Thanks, Senator David Shoebridge and Dr. William Briggs for their contribution. Don't forget to like, subscribe this video, even leave a constructive comment if you'd like, or you can become a financial contributor to help our work for as little as $5 a month. Go to greenleft.org.au. Thank you for joining us. I'm Suzanne James. Thank you.